Okay, perfect. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasmine Mora. I'm part of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Um, I would like to welcome you all to yet another amazing session of the We Champion Series speaker. Uh, for this one in particular, we have two amazing presenters, Steve Rawlinson and Stephen Skoffman. We will give them the floor. Hopefully they'll do their presentation and present their work. And then towards the end, if we get a little bit more time, we can uh, do a few questions. If you have specific questions, you can write them in the chat or wait until the end of the session to raise your hand and then we'll, we'll let you ask your question. Uh, please know that all our sessions are being recorded. So if you know someone that couldn't attend but was very interested in the subject, we can definitely give you a link to our YouTube so you can watch it later. Um, these are a series of um, sessions that are organized by Mission 4.7. As you know, Mission 4.7 is a network of organizations that promote transformative education and target 4.7 more specifically. And without further ado, I wanna give the floor to our amazing presenters so they can introduce themselves as well. Thank you very much, Jasmine. That's very kind of you. And thank you very much for the, for the invitation. We're thrilled to be here. Um, and looking forward to sharing our thoughts with you, uh, the audience, and also hearing from them. That would be really good if it was a two-way process. Um, what we're going to try and do is address some of the concerns that we hear from teachers and children and all those that are involved in education about the environment crisis that's unfolding all around us. Um, in lots of different ways and in, in alarming consequences. What we're particularly concerned is what we can do about it, both personally and professionally. And what we can do when we live in a society and a global culture that has a range of priorities, many of which don't particularly align well with the term sustainability. So the arguments that we're going to present and the ideas that we're going to show you are drawn from this book that we have re we recently published um, and from an international readership. And in that, we focus particularly on teachers and students in training for going on to working with children aged between three and 14. And that age group is particularly significant because they are the people that are going to inherit the planet that we leave. So it's a, it was aimed deliberately at the younger age group. It also, we're also going to deal with some of the issues to do with curriculum management and organisation of how you teach sustainability. And we may look at a few practical activities for classroom use. And what we're going to say draws both on educational theory and research, as well as our own and other people's personal experience over many years. So next slide, please, if you could. So who, who are we? Well, I'm Steve Rawlinson. I've had the, the, the privilege of, of working in every sector of education from the little ones right through to um, what we might term the, the, the third age uh, um, people. I, I have two, I've over two decades of experience as a principal lecturer in geography education at Northumbria University. I was Geographical Association president 2015 to 16. And until recently, I've been editing the journal for the Geographical Association called Primary Geography. And my colleague will introduce himself. Yeah, I'm Dr. Stephen Scoffham, uh, an educational author and uh, consultant for school atlases. Uh, I'm currently working on a new edition of a, of a atlas for primary school children, children aged eight and over. And I'm a visiting reader in sustainability and education at Canterbury Christchurch University in, in Kent in England. And like Steve, I was one time uh, president of the UK Geographical Association. We only have a one year tenure, by the way. So uh, it, it, there's a sort of throughput. So you just get a, a year of glory and then, you, and then you sort of drop off the conveyor belt at the end. So um, introducing ourselves a little bit further, sustainability, and climate change is a daunting prospect, I think, for many teachers, largely because they lack training and guidance in a complicated area. The evidence is 
that many teachers, where they do teach it, are actually either following their own enthusiasms or focusing on popular topics like maybe plastic pollution or current events. And much depends on sort of an ad hoc approach. And despite some very good papers and reports over decades, and I was looking recently at the recent reports from UNESCO, there remains a huge dearth, a huge gap between the rhetoric and the reality, the rhetoric of what we could and should be doing and the reality of actually what is happening and the constraints which are actually constraining us in the classroom. So if we could have a next slide, please. So Steve mentioned that young people are the people who will be inheriting the future as it were, and we're all aware of that. And young people are well aware of that as well. And of course, it's been highlighted in the last couple of years uh, by Greta Thunberg and the climate strikes which uh, have erupted all over the world. In the UK, there was a very large survey recently called the Big Ask, uh, which uh, attracted th literally thousands of responses from children and young people of all different age groups. And what it revealed was the two things that they were most concerned about. And the two things were health and well-being, health and well mental well-being, and wait for it, the, the environment. It doesn't make a huge amount of surprise really to get that, but there's some firm evidence from a very large survey. And certainly the climate strikes, I think, talk everybody by surprise by the amount of support and concern that they, that they highlighted. But I think the point that we're very much aware of is that um, it's one thing to chant, keep the oil in the soil and things like that, but it's, that has the problem of being simplistic and it doesn't recognize the connections. And of course, one of the challenges of sustainability and one of the challenges we've got to address in all sorts of different levels is that it isn't happening in isolation. So biodiversity loss, acidification of the oceans, social disruption, economic activity uh, being uh, destabilized, different cultural values, global equity and justice, all these things roll together in a very complicated way. They're big, difficult issues to get hold of. They can seem rather daunting, but I suppose what one of the things, arguments that we make in the book very strongly is that social and cultural issues are very much at the heart and there's a danger uh, that in popular thinking the science is the focus so even in the UK government for example uh, the recent uh, unit on climate change and sustainability sees sustainability is located in geography science and citizenship it doesn't see it as located in the arts and the humanities where it belongs every bit as strongly in our view so next one please so what we've tried to do is to combine our research, our understanding of theory and our own professional experience and the professional experience of colleagues in countries in places as disparate as South Africa, Israel, Australia, United States, uh, to provide an in-depth guidance on how to teach sustainability education. And we've contextualized our approach within a wider educational framework, which recognizes it the general earth principles, which was articulated uh, so clearly and I think so excellently in the earth charter some 20 years ago, but the idea that if you don't care for the earth, you're not going to, you're nowhere as it were. Uh, we recognize that the SDGs provide a, uh, United Nations Global Goals, provide a wonderful and very useful framework, despite the fact that they're open to lots of criticisms. And we recognize the importance of the personal qualities and values that individuals hold and young people ascribe to. So these different two different definitions of sustainability or two ways of looking at it are represented in this slide. The mantra, as it were, of the three pillars, the environment, economy and society, which is reflected very strongly in the SDGs, has been taken us a long way, but it is uh, flawed in our view, like all approaches are going to be flawed, but uh, the big flaws there are things like the, the there are more than three pillars. Where's power? Where's politics? Where's culture? Where's religion? Where's a whole lot of stuff in those pillars uh, which are not really properly represented? And are the pillars all equal sizes or are some parts of the uh, 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 that temple of sustainability lopsided? And 
uh, we all know that the economy is a hugely fat, uh, uh, thick pillar, and the environment, sadly, tends to be a, a crumbling and decaying one rather than the, the strong one that it absolutely has to be. Uh, the representation of sustainability that we favour is the one on the right, uh, and you can begin this at a number of different points. So you could look at sustainability in the centre and say, well, sustainability depends on or hinges around how we connect and think about ourselves, how we think about others, and how we think about the future and our responsibilities to those who are not yet born, as well as uh, 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 different peoples and different parts of the world. And it's a much more dynamic model. I could say a lot more about it, but um, I think that's probably enough for the time being. So on to the next slide. And this takes us to something else which we highlight in our book. And that is that without some kind of framework, it's difficult to see how we can really articulate what it means to be sustainability literate. And what this might look like, not only in the ground, but also with children and pupils of different ages. So we've tried to draw on a wide range of literature and research to identify unifying ideas, uh, which actually unifying ideas and concepts are very much part of every discipline, but they're not yet fully developed or even, uh, uh, um, I don't think the prototype is yet on the table for sustainability education. So we've put the three pillars in the middle, the economic, the social and the ecological, and you can see the difference between the concepts, development, growth and progress on the one side and habitats and interdependence and tipping points on the other. They're very different ways of thinking. It's one of the problems of sustainability. At the top, we put some general principles like system thinking, resilience and connections and interconnections, but perhaps the foundation, even more importantly at the bottom, personal qualities like creativity, wisdom, you could have humility there if you want, wonder, a whole range of uh, personal qualities uh, which uh, absolutely uh, make sustainability education what it is. So we recognize that that whole attempt to identify the unifying principles opens up deeper questions about what education is and what it can be. And then one other thing that we wanted to highlight is turning over to the next slide, please. And I think Steve is going to highlight this for us. Yep. So what are the distinctive features about sustainability education that we have identified from those particular principles that we've just discuss with you. Well, first of all, we think it lacks an agreed knowledge or conceptual base. There are no clear boundaries and it has a huge but ill-defined Ill knowledge base. And that can make it very difficult and daunting to teach, particularly for new teachers um, coming into the profession, knowing what it is that they're actually trying to teach. Secondly, it involves the whole person. It's a, it's a head, hands and heart situation it's not just about knowledge and there's a clear need for emotional engagement and that contradicts certainly from this country where um, there is a great emphasis on simple sorry not simple but just knowledge um, we believe there's a need for an emotional engagement as well thirdly it's best taught through practical activity and action giving children a sense of ownership in the face of what appears to be overwhelming global problems is definitely the way to go. They then feel they can actually do something and it tries to mitigate the gloom and doom that unfortunately a lot of them seem to be feeling at the moment about what, what is facing the world. Fourthly, it takes an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, sustainability doesn't have to be a se separate subject. Um, we need to move away from those traditional subject structures and silos, which we, we've, we've got ingrained into. Um, and that's a really, really important point. And that's something that we would want to emphasize right the way through. Fifthly, it's about developing a mindset, judgment and wisdom. It, it, it's, it's about the whole child, not just their knowledge, etc. And it demands pupils can synthesize information, that they can think critically and creatively and take appropriate action. The word appropriate is particularly appropriate there. 
Sixthly, it confronts uncomfortable truths about life today. Um, it pivots around social as well as scientific issues, as Stephen has, has quite rightly um, suggested earlier on. And you only have to think about how sea level rise is impacting on small island developing states to realise that. Um, if you remember the picture of the economic minister from Tuvalu giving the address at the COP26 yeah. conference from a lectern in the middle of the ocean, then that sort of, that's the picture that you, know, you can see there. Seventhly, it's predicated on values and moral responsibility. And those, of course, are in understood and interpreted in a variety of ways relating to cultures and religions, social mores, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's, it's a very variable idea. Um, and, and that is its strength, but also it, it, it creates lots of difficulties as well. And thirdly, thirdly, sorry, eighthly, it shifts the relationship between ourselves and the planet. It shifts that quite dramatically. And because of that, it's always evolving. It's constantly evolving and therefore mapping the progression of children along a sustainability continuum is quite difficult because it's not going to be a linear progress that they make um, when looking at sustainability. So for all these reasons, it's, it, it can be quite scary for teachers to actually come into and look at this, which is why in, and largely why we decided to write the book and more importantly, set the book out in the way that we did. Lacks and uh, good knowledge. Sorry. Okay. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what we've done is having, as Stephen has outlined, identified what sustainability looks like We've then gone into looking at some areas of study that you might adopt in order to look at sustainability. And we've identified 12 areas of study which are indicative of the scope of the terrain. And you can see as you run down these things like Earth in space, watery planet, things that you would expect, food and farming, the global village, special places. They are not all about weather and climate. That is something that you really need to, to, to know. It's not sustainability, it's not just about weather and climate, which is the fixation that a lot of um, governments seem to have got into. And if you, you might try and match up the photographs with each of those particular areas of study, that might be something you could, you, you could try and do. And if you do, you'll find that there are more photographs or less photographs than there are topics. And we've done that quite deliberately to just make the point that everything is connected, you can use more than one photograph, um, sorry, you can use one photograph more than once. Everything is equally connected. So it's a really important idea to, to bring out when you're looking at curriculum organization, that there are not just these 12 areas of study, these are the ones that we chose, but it's a very vast topic, very vast uh, landscape that we need to look at with 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 sustainability. Steve, if I could just butt in as well, as well and say that that list chimes uh, very closely with the SDGs. So the SDGs give us uh, a, a whole range of uh, targets to do with the natural world, like life in, uh, on land and life on, on, in the water, but it also gives us targets to do with economic activity, which you can see there in jobs, transport and energy, and so on. So actually the um, the SDGs are one of the reference points. Again, we haven't got time to explain the rationale for how we've made the choices that we've made, but I just thought I'd flag that up. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. That's a, that's a very important point. Thank you for doing that. Um, so when it comes to curricular organisation of, of putting these things into a curriculum, how do we do that? Well, we've made a suggestion via a table which shows how each of these topics involves different curriculum subjects and builds understanding in a progressive and age-related manner. So we've tried to exemplify how things would work. And I think that's the point that we're trying to make. We're not suggesting this is a curriculum. We're suggesting this is a way in which you might think about organizing a curriculum and it's an exemplar. 
And we've also given examples drawn from contexts both in the UK and overseas of how sustainability education is being approached by different schools. And they're really fascinating, very inspiring. And we'll give you some ideas about how different places in the world are approaching the sustainability issue. Next slide, please, Jasmine. So that takes us on to some challenges. So what are the challenges that we particularly want to highlight today? Well, the first one is ensuring that teachers have the knowledge and the confidence to help children understand difficult issues. The knowledge and skills and enthusiasm of the teacher are obviously fundamental. So this challenge focuses really on teacher education and in-service training. How is teacher education organised? And how is, insert, how is the, the initial teacher education then built upon from the in-service training that follows on once teachers are in service? Secondly, the connected nature of sustainability demands a holistic approach. As I've said before, subject silos are not helpful. The traditional disciplines no longer really match current needs as well as they did. There have been repeated calls for fundamental reform of schooling. And we question how schools will evolve in the future. Maybe it's time for a radical rethink. Thirdly, a sustainable curriculum demands new ideas about how school subjects timetables are organised. If sustainability and sustainable education require a change of mindset, how is that going to happen? How are we going to get through uh, um, to those in power how school subjects and timetables might be organised? And then fourthly, we need to embed practical action, revisiting and validating the benefits of practical pedagogies for long term change. What are the pedagogies that are going to be most important, most effective? There's widespread agreement that sustainability and climate change education should involve direct action, but it's very difficult to organise this in a progressive way across an entire school community. So these are some of the questions that are encapsulated in a different way in the final slide, which Stephen's going to now look at. Next slide, please, Jesse. One of the um, things which crops up as we so often as we delve into sustainability and sustainability education literature is the call for a paradigm shift. Uh, and that's what really Steve was outlining in the previous slide. Uh, a, a real rethink about what we're doing and how we're doing it and we know that that makes sense but we don't know how to get there I suspect and maybe what we're offering is some notes as it were some clues along the way of how that journey might be uh, initiated and developed but I'm very much aware and I think we, we both are of the huge disconnect between what is actually happening on the ground and what we need to do and there's this reality gap and we're all busy in our own ways uh, doing our very best to put girders and nuts and bolts and, and braces and all the other things uh, together to make the bridge uh, between one side of the chasm and the other uh, where real but the reality gap is is huge and uh, unfortunately, some of those girders keep, seem to keep on, as it were, to pursue the metaphor, plunging into the abyss beneath us. So uh, we continue the work in our, all of us in our different way. And I would favour multiple clumsy solutions to uh, coin, if not to, to use a phrase from Mike Holm, uh, the idea that little clumsy solutions build up over time rather than mega solutions, which are so difficult to initiate, so difficult to form and so difficult to uh, agree upon. But the question is, do we have the time, the resilience and the power in one for, within our own spheres of life to make the changes that are needed? And I'm reminded, uh, by, of Alvin Toffler, who many, many years ago wrote a book called Future Shock, in which he flagged up the way in which uh, human beings uh, could only cope with so much change. And he talked about exceeding uh, their adaptive range. And I do wonder in, in a political sense and indeed an educational sense as well as to whether uh, the limits of that adaptive range are one of the reasons why some of these girders which we're trying to put across the abyss are, are not uh, so firmly planted as they should be. 
So I hope that's a sort of given some sort of uh, a clue as to where we're coming from, what we've been thinking about for not only the two or three years when we've been writing the book, but the 40 odd years, frightening to do the arithmetic, uh, <laughs> of our careers when we've been delving into sustainability and sustainability education in different ways. But um, we're very much looking forward to questions and discuss further discussion. That, that, was, ama that was amazing. Uh, thank you both so much. I know it's so little time to explain so many things and you're thinking behind things. So I really appreciate that you were able to like, synthesize as much as you were. Um, like Stephen said, we will now take questions either from the audience. And if not, I have a couple of questions as well. So you can write them on the chat or you can raise your hand. Either way is fine. Um, in the meantime, I was wondering, what are some of the expectations you have about this guy that you have created? Steve, do you want to pick that up? Um, basically, the, the, the most important one that I think what the expectation we, we feel we'd like most of all is the one that we sort of started with, which we're very conscious that teachers often haven't got the confidence to tackle sustainability from an informed perspective. And so we set out right in the book to try and address that particular uh, issue. Um, and we, we'd hope that by reading the book and, and using it in a practical sense, that confidence would grow. Um, that's one of the things we, we really would, would like to see. Um, and it, it's complex, isn't it? You know, we, we'd hope that um, by looking at what we've tried to set out, they would begin to realise that sustainability is not just about knowledge, it is about that emotional engagement. And there's more to sustainability than just the pure knowledge about weather and climate, etc. So that's one expectation. Yeah, and how do you set about it uh, in a you know on a whole school level? Uh, uh, how do you where are you going to begin? How do you break yeah. into this very difficult thing called sustainability? Don't want to over egg the difficulty of it, but I do want to stress that it requires uh, a degree of expertise which. Uh, yeah takes time to develop and yeah. which uh, many practitioners lack, simply not because they're inadequate, but because uh, that wasn't on their agenda and hasn't been on their agenda. And threading your way through uh, a, a whole subject, which itself is an area of learning, which is evolving and constantly changing, is, is, is a challenge. It's bound to be a challenge, but uh, hopefully, uh, we've hoped to move the debate forward uh, significantly. We'd like to think that it is a significant publication which sets out some you un thinking which hasn't been articulated in that way previously. Yes, completely. Um, we have a question in the chat. It says, give me one second. It would be great to have sustainability curriculum. What is a good tip or trick to involve sustainability, sustainability in everyday academics? Right. Well, my role at Canterbury Christchurch is to help develop the academic portfolio of the university. Uh, uh, so uh, with respect to sustainability, um, I think it's about example. I think it's about uh, 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 colleagues who are doing uh, unusual and interesting things in different ways around sustainability, which is infectious. It's exactly the same as in the classroom. And uh, that rubs off within the uh, uh, various forums in which colleagues meet. It rubs off in the feedback from st students. Uh, it comes uh, uh, in all sorts of different ways. And I would go for the sort of soft targets and, 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 and a bolstering and building the capability of capacity uh, of, 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 of the institution uh, through uh, getting a critical mass of colleagues on board. Uh, because it can't be one person thin. It's got to be something that spreads across the board. So I don't know if, it, if, it is a, if it's a trick, but the approach, uh, which is uh, to you know, find ways in which you can have those conversations, those exchanges of ideas in which you, 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 you which are buzzy, which uh, generate uh, new thinking about how to go about introducing sustainability doesn't have to be a, a new subject on the curriculum and then if you do that you put a box around it uh, yeah. and we're, we're we're aware of that danger 
Uh, we've talked about all sorts of things uh, about having introductory weeks and so on, where all students take part in uh, sustainability awareness raising, and that's a good idea, but it's difficult to staff. And again, if you haven't got the colleagues who are competent, in, uh, not competent, who haven't got the uh, uh, background to do it, uh, then it's not going to work very well. So um, I hope that sort of begins to open up that uh, way of thinking. Yeah, no, I completely agree that um, tap in not only on the resources that you have available, but also the people around you and using those networks to try to like get yourself into, into these subjects and trying to figure out how to include it in, in everyday learning, which is, like you said, a challenge on itself because there's so much um, expected from educators that um, yeah. having to add extra things and having to figure out how to frame things differently can be quite challenging when they're already planning their, their sessions and they're already doing so much. And I'd, I'd just like to add that, you know, sort of we do find that one of the dangers is that you, if you raise uh, global awareness and uh, sustainability awareness in a way that uh, we think is absolutely essential, students then come back and say, well, what can I do? What is it that I can do which is practical? You know, how can I, how, how can I uh, cope with knowing that things are so badly wrong as we, uh, 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 as you've been telling us? Uh, and, you know, finding ways of channeling and holding that anxiety is uh, again another aspect of what this is all about and it's just part of the terrain mm. exactly it can be extremely overwhelming to learn about how everything mm. is just on a global scale it's kind of like going downhill and it's very overwhelming for students and trying to figure out how they fit in the world and how they can actually make a difference that within their own communities so having that view of these are all the problems on the bigger scale, but here are the things that we can do to change those things on our scale. It's probably a very important conversation to have to, like you said, to reduce anxiety from students and educators as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know if we have any other questions. There's something in the chat about a, a, a comment or a, is that from yes, Augusta? Is a it says, most of the SDGs are already in our curriculum. What we need to do more is get our students to participate more in the learning process and get them aware of how to preserve our community and environment. Mm. That's, that's a great comment, which ties with mm. what you were saying about the whole global versus what you can do on a local level and how to get people engaged. And you know, talking about the countered currents and you know the, those girders which fall fall off the bridge, as it were, uh, there's so much pressure in in the in a neoliberal culture which seems to be uh, uh, the common common denominator these days. Uh, that universities are turned into businesses and students see their experience as being trans you know, it's a very transactional relationship uh you know they they and they come to university and they want the certificate and they want to get a good job as a result of it and that's the deal and so you know within an educational sense for example when we've introduced global awareness and sustainability as a module for students who are intending to be teachers they've come back and said yeah but that's not actually what we need what we need is more on maths and english because that's the uh, priority in the schools in which we're working and you can see the you can see the logic of that and the difficulty of as it were kicking against the uh, tide and the current of the society in which we're living. David Orr, um, uh, who many of you may know of, has a wonderful phrase about, about walking, I don't know which way the train's going, walking north on a southbound train. And uh, sometimes I feel that what, that's what we're doing. I think it's the right thing to be doing, even if the train is going in the wrong direction, we need to walk down the corridor in the opposite direction because uh, that's the right thing to be doing. Yeah, that, that, that sort of mirrors my thought that it's a case of being brave. One has mm. to be brave and, and make the leap. Um, and I, I'm reminded of a, a teacher in a local school some 20 years ago who very bravely just decided that Fridays would be um, a day when all the children in, in the whole school would work outside on their in their grounds, building a community forest or community garden, community a whole community um, outdoor environment. and it was an amazing achievement. They achieved so much in about three years with this particular project. Um, what was fascinating was 
that he had the best science and maths results of the entire county, having lost a whole day of normal subjects. And I thought, I think that says quite a lot, really. But he was brave, you know, he, he, he took that idea. And I suppose I hinted him in, in, at some point that um, uh, the unifying principles begin to chip away at thinking around what the purpose of education is, you know, and as we quite quickly and regularly have to come back to this, I think. What is it that we what justifies yeah. us in intervening in children's upbringing and, 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 and taking years of their life, many, many years of their life uh, away, from, not exactly away from them, but intervening uh, 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 in, in their childhood in that massive way. And so the, turning that round, for, for us, the question is, you know, what is the life message that children are going to take away from their schooling? And if yeah. that life message does not include and is not, I think, actually centrally uh, 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 pivoting around uh, how we're going to live sustainably and uh, uh, reasonably equitably on the planet that sustains us, we've actually missed the, we missed the target. Uh, uh, that's where we need to be heading. And actually, we need to be doing that as a matter of urgency. It's, uh, I mean, the other thing as our long careers is both Steve and I have uh, written things uh, many years ago, which are more or less the same as uh, addressing the same problems as we're finding today. It's, uh, uh, so it, it's bittersweet. We have to be hopeful. We have to have a vision and we do. Uh, we have to be positive and we are, but we recognize the context in which we're working. Sorry, that was probably rather a, 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 a bit of a ramble, but I, it comes at things in different ways. No, that was perfect. That was a perfect um, summary and closing remark. I would say if I, I don't think there are any other comments in the chat. I think that was the last one. Um, if you want to maybe have some little time for some more closing remarks, please go ahead. Um, we are so thankful for you to take the time to present your work to us and just give us even more tips on how to include sustainability in everyday learning, which I know that a lot of educators and students are struggling with. If this isn't inappropriate or a bit cheeky, the Bloomsbury uh, Academic website has a companion website for the book. And I want to mention it simply because uh, even if you don't want the book, have a look at the website because it's got lots of free resources on it, a huge number. There are 34 sections to it and oh, a whole wow. range of prepared uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations. So if you want a ready-made PowerPoint presentation on what sustainability might mean, for example, or a ready-made PowerPoint uh, presentation on the SDGs, there is something there on that website. Thank you so much for the tip. And Stephen and Steve, thank you so much for taking the time again. It was a pleasure, pleasure. and an honor to have you. Um, and Thank hopefully you. you'll join us in the future for more sessions of the yes, please. Champion yes. series. Yeah, we'd love to. We'd love to. Um, well, I think that I can let everyone go now. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember that this recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel that um, my colleague Kane posted on the, on the chat. So you can revisit it and watch it again if you want to. And send it to the people that maybe weren't able to make it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You. All the best. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All the best. Bye.